were joined by the host, who boomed merrily in common. So, this is the human male I've heard so much about. <laughs> Bells and jeweled hoops pierced the host's ears. Purple and red ribbons draped his vest and wreathed his neck. Beaumark glanced at Scola. No doubt you have. Scola put his book down and made an unknown gesture towards their host. Then, the Ramsha handed Beaumark a triangular four-sided object. Beaumark studied it. The size of a baby's fist. It had ornately curved Ramsha heads on each side, with tiny round bells on the corners. Two silver, one black and iron, and one gold. He looked back to the host. Give me pardon. I don't understand your customs. What should I do with this? The host chortled. Roll for your supper. Silver bell up, you pay no more price. Iron bell up, you pay twice the price of your meal. Gold bell up, you eat for free. Beaumark slid the die towards Scola. Perhaps he should roll? Scola pushed it back. Roll it. Beaumark did. The tiny bells tinkled, and the Ramsha hosts smiled widely. The topmost bell was iron. <laughs> hey, me good scholar. Hello, welcome to Breath of Life Development. My name is Josh Foreman, and what you just heard there was a little snippet from our latest book, The Scarred King, book two, Journey. And it was narrated by my friend Cardboard Arm Man, who is an amazing Twitch streamer. Uh, link in the description, please check him out. But uh, as you can see, everything's a little up in the air as we're moving into the new space here. Uh, it's, <laughs> but have no fear. We do have some really cool process to see today. Um, and it has to do with the sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legend. No, I'm just kidding. The sponsor of today's video is uh, me. It's, it's just me, I'm sponsoring my own video. And what am I sponsoring it with? Uh, the announcement that we now have a place that you can go to purchase Tales from Talifar collectibles. I'm really excited about this. It's taken a long time to get this process up and running. Uh, thanks to partnering with my friend Chris, uh, we have a process where I do the, the design and the art, I sculpt it up, and then I send him the original, and then he does all the molding, casting, painting, fulfilling the orders, etc., etc. All that stuff that, like, whenever I tried to imagine opening up a shop, I just, I couldn't get past that hurdle. So, this partnership allows us to do that, and that's really exciting. And our first product is, uh, is this. It is a... <laughs> A Rumshaw dice, as you saw from the intro there, and you can you can own a physical version of it now. It's really exciting. I'm really excited about this. Have I mentioned excitement? It's a thing that's happening right now in my head parts. Um, yeah. So where where can you buy this? You ask. Uh, it's this little website called Amazon. Amazon.com. You may have heard of it. It's a little kind of philanthropic website dedicated to uh, sending fake cowboys to space, or at least close to space. Uh, you know, they do their best. And uh, but, but another thing they do is they allow artisans like myself and my partner to put our little, our little shop up there. So I'm really, really happy that we get to do that. So let's dive into the process and see how this collectible uh, was created uh, right now. Here we go, here we go. I'm excited. Did I mention excitement? Well, it didn't start out too exciting. It started in Blender. Blender is a 3D program that lets you move vertices and faces around. And I think I started with a triangle that I downloaded off the internet just because I wasn't sure exactly how to get one that was perfectly proportionate. Uh, and then I started adding little bevels and details and stuff like that. After that, I um, exported it and brought it into ZBrush. Now, at this point, I thought I had the basic structure where I wanted it, but then I wanted to tweak things. As, and uh, as you can see, uh, ZBrush is not the best with modeling. It's good for sculpting, and there's kind of a technical difference there. But it does have some modeling features, such as this. I was able to make some adjustments. And then I started bringing in sculptures that I had made to create illustrations for the book. I just cut the heads off of my rumshaw and added them to the dice, started squishing them around so they would fit in these little alcoves. And, um, but 
I didn't quite like how they were, you know, perfectly realistic. I wanted to give them sort of a, you know, a miniature carved feel, so, or, or a beaten metal sort of look. And here's the tip where I was going to insert the bells. I found these bells on Amazon that I thought would be a good size, and I thought this little um, notch in there would be a good place to thread a wire through and have the bells stuck in there really well. And we'll see where that leads uh, in a little bit. After I was done, I 3D printed. This is a 3D printer from a company called Frozen with a PH. It's pretty old, but it gets the job done. So I popped it off of the build plate and then popped it into a little sonic bath here with alcohol. Uh, I recently learned that you could put it in a smaller bag filled with alcohol and then put that bag into water. And I think that's gonna save me a lot of alcohol in the future. Uh, then clip away the supports and you're left with kind of a gnarly surface. I have this uh, sonic knife cutter thing that does a little bit of a cleaner job, but um, yeah, sometimes it's better to just yank and rip this stuff away. I'm still perfecting my technique. But I do use this sonic cutter to sort of clean up the, the little bits and then do filing and sanding and stuff like that. All right, and time to test fit these bells. So it seemed like a pretty straightforward process. I could slot the bells in. I could imagine putting the little wire in there and then covering it with resin, but I didn't actually do that because I was going to send this down to Chris to do the mold making, and he can't do the mold making if the bells are already attached. So after I was comfortable with my plan for how the bells would fit in, I had to clean up the rest of the piece. You can see the print lines here. This was printed in as fine a resolution as I could get off of this old printer. And so there's still stuff to clean up. So more refinement, more sanding and carving. A few more little supports that needed to be removed. I'm using a UV light on the piece after I carve into it because the UV only penetrates so deeply during the curing process that it can't hurt to give it a little extra boost. Okay, now I sanded this bell down and I'm painting it black. I just want to experiment with how to get the blackened metal bell look that I need for one of the sides. And I'm using this gap filler to go in and clean this up. I figured that um, since I couldn't really get the same kind of gouges all the way around, I would start with it really clean and then maybe do the texture with a, uh, another process later. Now I couldn't really sand in the indents of these triangle shaped alcoves. So rather than trying to sand into them, I decided to just cut sheets of styrene because those would be perfectly flat and then glue those into place. Then sanding down the gap filler. a little wet sanding. And progressively using finer and finer sandpaper. 
And this is between coats of primer. And every time I spray the primer, I go in and I sand it down again. And then it's shipped off to Houston where Chris will take care of the rest of the process. Take it away, Chris. So Chris is starting by making a mold box and he's got to make a bed of clay for it to sit in that is going to be one of, one of the parts of the mold. I do have a video on mold making. Uh, this is going to be a little more complex mold than that and I'll be doing a more in-depth uh, video about mold making at some point. But for now you can kind of get the basics. So he's got the bottom of the box built and then the clay laid up and now he's building the sides of the box. And making sure that the clay presses against the edges really tightly. It's got to be all sealed up or the rubber will leak through. And there's little indents in there. You'll see how that gets um, put into the rubber and then the two pieces of rubber can fit together because of those little notches. And after pouring the first batch, he pulls away that clay and has to clean up where any rubber has leaked through. He's using these beads to see how much rubber he's gonna need for the second pour. This little bit of clay is going to be the pour spout where the resin goes in after the second rubber is poured. And here's what it looks like before he pops the original out and after. So now it's time to pour the resin. He's mixing in some black tint. We're making sure that we use really tough resin here because we do want this to be able to be used as a dice and roll around and stuff. So it needs to be pretty robust. So he pours in some rubber, he's tapping it around to try to get rid of as many bubbles as possible, and then puts it into a pressure chamber, which makes all the bubbles super tiny. Pressure goes up while it cures. Then he lets it out. And here we go. Now, one of the main things you have to deal with when you're creating a mold is you want a strategy that leaves as few surfaces flat or pointed straight up as possible because that's where you're gonna encounter bubbles like these. And then it was just a matter of a lot of trial and error to get the mold exactly where it needs to be so that those bubbles are fewer. Back in Seattle, I had printed out a second version of this so that I could figure out exactly how I wanted Chris to attach the bells. And I'm using epoxy here. I have a video about using epoxies for sculpting right here if you want to check that out. I wanted to come up with something that was pretty simple and straightforward since this needs to be done four times on every dice, which is a lot of manual labor. And I painted over it originally because I was going to blend it into the paint for the rest of it. But then I gave it a test roll and yeah. That is not ideal for a dice that needs to roll, is it? So I had to come up with a new battle plan. I traveled all the way back to my living room where I could get on my work computer and start remodeling, redesigning the tip of this thing because this is just not up to my quality standards.
And I figured while I'm in here, I might as well add this other design feature that I forgot previously, which is to add little pips to it so that you could use this as a regular four-sided die as well. And another 3D print. This is number three at this point. Uh, sometimes they peel off like this. It's so satisfying. And stupidly, I forgot to put a little gap in the tip here for the, uh, the little rings on the bells. So I started using a hand drill to make a hole for it and quickly realized that was not going to be big enough. So I went to the power drill and this almost wasn't a complete mistake. I had to use a drill bit large enough that I could slot the bell in in any rotation. And there we go, snug as a bug in a rug. However, as you can see, not all the drilling experience turned out that clean. I shattered two of the four sides and required a lot of cleanup work now. I could have gone back, changed the design, and then reprinted, but I thought it'd be a little less work to just glue these pieces back together. Honestly, I'm not sure which would have been faster. Now here I'm etching in some texture so that when the bells are inserted, the epoxy has something to grip onto to hold them in place. I figure it's better to go overboard on making sure these bells are gonna stay in place this time. And then ship this new version to Texas again, where Chris had to do the entire molding process again. But the final result, I think, is beautiful. Uh, we both played around with rolling these on all sorts of surfaces to make sure that the bells would stay in place. And uh, yeah, it's great now. Very robust. And that is how we made this collectible. Yay. Please like and subscribe this, share it around to people that are interested in dice and other creative endeavors. That would be awesome. Um, if you, when you, when you check out the store on Amazon, you will also note these other delightful collectibles, Bowmark and Scola. Other, uh, these are the protagonists from our trilogy. And then coming soon, or I mean, I think statistically, most people are actually watching this in the future. So, so they're now probably on that website. We also have collectible medallions for the books. Look how shiny these are. We're gonna have, these are limited edition. There will be uh, the standard silver and then like these gold uh, signature edition, which will have, they'll be on a little stand that will have uh, my signature and my co-author's signature and these will be true collector's items someday. You know, when Tales from Talafar is a household name and it's bigger than Star Wars, imagine having these first edition collectible coins. It's gonna be exciting, you guys. Did I mention excitement? Anyway, uh, yeah, thanks so much to my patrons. You guys are the best. So many of you have been with me for years and I super appreciate that. If you guys would like to be a patron, check out my link below and uh, you'll be updated every week with my progress. Speaking of progress, I stream on Twitch. Please go to twitch.tv slash Josh Foreman, probably. There's a link in the description. Just go look at that. Thanks again, everyone, and I'll see you on the next one where hopefully the shop will be together. I may be actually doing a video about the 
the organization of the shop. I think that's just kind of an interesting meta issue for artists in general. Like arranging your space can have such an impact on your creativity because there are there are definitely definitely ways you can enhance and impede creativity based on the space that you're in and access to your materials and stuff. I've learned a lot about that over the years. I have not um, been in a position to like just start from scratch like this in a long time. So I'm really excited to kind of dive into the theory of that and try to put it into practice. And yeah, so tune in next time. I'll see you guys then. Bye.